Celtic Badass of the Week showcases a different badass person of Celtic heritage each week. Those who exemplify the give no shit attitude and come on on top. They may come from our past or our present, but rest assured they come from all walks of life and legend. They are men, women, even old ladies and pirate queens. You don't have to be a muscled up Celt in a fur kilt swinging a mighty sword. You can just be a 4 foot 11 Welsh woman and suffragette who knows jujitsu. Most of these badasses are all too real. While some may be only legend, badass legends though. The only prerequisite for this title is Celtic blood and badassedness. Tommy McPherson, aka the Kilted Killer. Still a schoolboy when World War II broke out, he was recruited into the Army straight from the Sixth Form College. He was picked to be the newly formed elite band of commandos, and earmarked for specialist training to carry out clandestine raids on enemy territory deep behind enemy lines. This Celtic badass quickly rose the ranks and matured into a legendary commando. This hardcore badass Scott is Tommy McPherson, aka the Kilted Killer. Now he served as an officer in the number 11 Scottish Commandos during World War II. So in 1941, during a daring four-man raid to capture Erwin Rommel in North Africa, he was captured by the enemy. In a span of two years, he escaped a total of seven times till finally making it back to the UK. Days after his return, he was ordered by Winston Churchill himself to set Europe ablaze. So he parachuted behind enemy lines in France and began a long campaign of destruction alongside the French resistance. Virtually every single night, he'd either kill Germans or destroy their supplies, communications, basically be a royal pain in the ass to the Nazis. There ain't nothing wrong with that. Now, on one occasion, when a German staff car was approaching a level crossing, uh, McPherson booby-trapped the barrier arm so it crashed down on the vehicle, decapitating the local commandant and his driver medieval style. Now few know how, but he persuaded the feared Das Reich tank column to surrender, and they did! He single-handedly captured 23,000 men in 1,000 vehicles in one night by simply convincing a German general that he was in command of the Allied forces in the area. Now that takes giant Scottish balls. As a touch of class, he would ride around the enemy countryside in a black French car with a British flag attached to it. Communists and Nazis alike put a price on his head. The Germans alone placed a 3,000 pound franc, I'm sorry, 3,000 franc bounty on his head. And then he then went to Italy and pretty much did all of the same above again. And so he began an extraordinary series of escapades in which he relied solely on his own cunning, bravery, initiative, and bad attitude to stay alive. While in North Africa, he slipped ashore from a submarine on a reconnaissance mission, but his sortie went dangerously wrong when the sub that was supposed to collect him pulled a boner and did not arrive. He was forced to trek for days on foot across the desert towards Allied lines, of course, sabotaging enemy installations as he went along just for fun. I guess his time blowing up shit in the desert wasn't fun enough, so he decided to take a forced vacation in Italy. He was captured by the Italian troops. Held in a prisoner of war camp in Italy, he made several attempts to escape, but was caught each time. He was handed over to the Germans and interrogated and tortured by the Gestapo, which is German for dickhead. Now eventually he ended up in a remote camp on the far eastern borders of Germany. There he made quick work of escape and slipped away from there wearing a French uh, army uniform. He eventually made it to the uh, Baltic coast and stowed away on a ship to neutral Sweden. Now this dude's daring and heroic feats of badassedness are too many to be counted. I mean he lived behind enemy lines and was hunted for years all the while killing Germans, blowing shit up and sporting a kilt while he did it. Now, his flamboyance made him a legend in France. On his return home in November 1943, he could have been for, uh, forgiven for seeking a quiet life after two years at the sharp end of a stick, but dodging bullets and Nazi forces was his thing. He had already endured and survived more danger and hardship than almost any other soldier. 
but his unrivaled experience of clandestine operations was vital to the war effort. He was needed for the Special Operations Executive to parachute into France and gee up the reluctant foot soldiers under French resistance in the aftermath of D-Day. At Churchill's behest, he was to arm them, train them, and lead them in guerrilla war against the occupying Germans. In the dead of night, accompanied by a French army officer and an English radio operator, he dropped into south-central France on June 8, 1944, which, if you know anything about history, that's two days after the Allies stormed Normandy beaches. He was in his Highlanders battle dress, kilt and all, and deliberately so. They wanted him to be very visible. His undisguised presence would be a symbol for anyone wavering, especially the French, and and a, a definite message that liberation was at hand. Now, he got wounded numerous times and awarded the Military Cross and many other medals for his actions during his time in the Army. He is one of the most badass decorated soldiers in history and the most decorated soldier in Britain. After the war, he went up to Oxford, gaining a first class degree. In his later years, he remained the president of the Oxford and Cambridge Athletics Club, having retired from his career as a successful businessman. Now, he was variously a director of the National Coal Board, a high sheriff of Greater London, but inevitably nothing in his later life had quite the drama and the extraordinary badass exploits as his earlier life did. Now, yet for 65 years this humble badass's Highlander story remained untold. But sadly, a few years ago he passed away, and all this came to light. He died at age 94 on November 6, 2014. A total badass.